and he's also a teacher at uh, Cedar Park uh, School System in uh, Bothell and uh, Mount Lake Terrace, I guess, yeah. And uh, so he, he's a, um, and it has a, a very a strong interest in uh, history and science, and he got interested in the Dead Sea Scrolls, so he's done some study of that, and he's going to report on what he has found um, in his study, what that shows us about the uh, accuracy of how the books of the Bible have been transmitted over the ages. So with that, Tim, why don't you take it away. You can just hit open with Google Slides there at the top. While they're uh, doing that, uh, I hope uh, you will not become drowsy tonight, uh, but I might. I was uh, rudely awakened this morning with my wife uh, screaming bloody murder at quarter till six this morning. I rushed out of the bedroom. I don't know what I was going to do in my pajamas, scare somebody away. By the time I got out there, she was uh, laughing her head off because my youngest son, who does not live at home anymore, was uh, going to go turkey hunting, and he was in the garage and then came into the kitchen to get some food, and she wasn't expecting him at quarter till six in the morning, and so she screamed because she thought it was an intruder. So, <laughs> so if I start to uh, nod off, uh, please, uh, please wake me up. So. Now you might be wondering, why am I here? I am not an expert. An expert is somebody who lives 30 miles away. I just live 10 miles away in Lake Stevens. So I, I'm, I'm not an expert. Uh, but I'm here. And most of the time you have a talk that has to do with creation and science and, and the Bible and, and how uh, science and creation fit into the framework of the Bible. And they give really credible views and answers for the scientific method. Is that not working? Did you, uh, did you go on from, from the creation website? If you, if you click on that banner, it, should, it was opening up earlier, so. So yeah, if you click on that, that, that uh, PowerPoint one, middle, that's not opening. That one that says PowerPoint slides right there in the middle of the screen. Yeah. Then they hit open with Google Slides. Is it because you lost an internet connection? There we go. Then hit present up in the right there. All right, so much for technology. Well, one of the things that really excites me about the Dead Sea Scrolls, to me, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls is very much uh, like an Indiana Jones movie. There's mystery, there's intrigue, maybe a little conspiracy. Sometime in the winter of 1946, 1947, there were three Bedouin shepherds uh, tending flocks uh, by the shores of the Dead Sea. And as um, men, boys are wont to do, they like to throw rocks. And where do you throw rocks? You throw rocks in caves. And when they heard something break, what do boys and men do when they hear something break? They leave. And so they left. About three days later, they came back and thought, well, maybe we should check out to see what broke. And what they found was they found what we now call the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. They had broken some pottery that was preserving some of the scrolls. These Bedouin shepherds had no idea what they found. But when you live a nomadic lifestyle, whatever you can find might be worth a couple dollars in your pocket. So they went to an antiquities dealer in Bethlehem by the name of Kando. And what do antiquities dealers like to do? They like to make money. And uh, the antiquities dealer said, 
Hmm, looks like it could be a value. Okay, um, I'll buy them. And I think he paid them $20 uh, for the scrolls. Then the antiquities dealers said, ah, they look old. I know a guy by the name of uh, Metropolitan Samuel, and he's the head of the monastery at St. Mark's there in Jerusalem. And he looked at them, and he thought, yeah, they look old, so I'll buy them for $100. At that time, there were some American scholars studying there in Jerusalem. And Metropolitan Samuel, the head of the monastery, had them look at these scrolls. And they realized from the handwriting that these are very old documents. They did not know how old uh, these scrolls were, but they knew that they were of value. Uh, They were authentic. And so Metropolitan Samuel, like most ministers or pastors, think, hmm, maybe we could get some money out of this to uh, benefit our ministry. So he had taken them to the United States and had uh, some scholars in the United States look at them and decided to sell them. And of all places he decided to sell them, he posted an ad in the Wall Street Journal. Yeah, you could have bought the old Dead Sea Scrolls uh, by, by Box F206 with contacting the Wall Street Journal. Now, he was hoping to get a million dollars for these scrolls. Now, let's back up a little bit. This is the very beginning of the nation of Israel, uh, the, the modern political state of Israel. There was barbed wire fences between Palestine, Bethlehem, and Jerusalem. There was a Jewish scholar, Eliezer Sukhanek, who was able to buy three of the scrolls in sort of a clandestine type of way, like giving money through barbed wire and getting the scrolls through barbed wire at night under cover of dark, like, like a mystery movie, you know, cloak and dagger, spy movie kind of thing. Now, he realized how valuable these were, and he thought this would be great for this new uh, political state of Israel to have all these scrolls. You know, it would just be good for morale, Uh, for the Jewish people. But there's a lot of people who were not friends of Israel at this time. And so what he had to do, his son, through an intermediary, bought the scrolls from Metropolitan Samuel after they were advertised in the Wall Street Journal. And so they were able to get the seven original scrolls all together for the nation of Israel. Now, if you take a look up there, There's only one of the scrolls that's a biblical book, and that is the book of Isaiah. And it is almost intact in its entirety. And all these seven are in the the, uh, shrine of the book there in Jerusalem. And I'll go on to explain that uh, some of these are community documents, like the community rule, the Thanksgiving hymns, the war scroll, uh, the Genesis Apocryphon. And there was also commentaries. There was actually a commentary on the book of Habakkuk, like we would pick up a commentary and read about um, explanations and applications of the book of Habakkuk. So this was a big um, windfall for the nation of Israel. It sort of gave them some prestige. So let's talk a little bit about the Qumran and where these were found. Qumran is located just a few miles south of Jericho on the northwest corner of the Dead Sea and uh, east of Jerusalem up and over the Judean uh, hills down into the lowest part of the planet, uh, which is the Dead Sea region. It's an area that's a lot of limestone caves, rocks, dry, arid region. There were 11 caves that um, in this general vicinity, and much, uh, much smaller caves as well. And as you take a look up there, that you can see that it's primarily cave four that had the preponderance of scrolls found in them. Uh, 157 uh, scrolls there were found. A few in other caves, some caves were excavated, uh, researched, and, and uh, look, they were looking in there to see if they could find others. But as you can see, some caves did not have any, some just a few. So here's a photo of the 
what the Dead Sea uh, region looks like from Qumran. You can see the hills, the cave areas. And then here is cave four where the preponderance of scrolls were found. These scrolls, some of them were stored in a jar cylinder of this nature. And they were rolled up, had a clasp around them. Now, when we think of the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we usually think of something like this. There were only about one or two scrolls actually preserved in the jars. It is amazing because it's such a dry area that for some 2,000 years, many of the scrolls were just lying on the ground, and, but they were preserved. Uh, so some people think maybe they were just left there in a hurry, um, stashed there to keep them away uh, from somebody who could have destroyed them. We don't know. But he, the scrolls are written in Hebrew, and Hebrew is an Oriental language, and so it reads from right to left. You go to the back of the book and read towards the front. So when you roll up a scroll, the outside portion, as you can see, would be the beginning of the book. And it's usually the outside portion that gets the most wear and tear and deteriorates where the inside part is preserved unless it gets a moisture and then it could rip inside as well. So this is how the scrolls were preserved. That is, those that were in containers. However, like I said, some of them were just stacked up on top of each other, and they have to be pried apart. It's a very meticulous process, and it's one of the reasons why it's taken so long to get all the information on the Dead Sea Scrolls out. The scrolls that were, that were fairly intact in their entirety, they got out uh, publicized quickly. So let's talk a little bit about this community of Qumran. Qumran is uh, described by several historians in the, um, both in the BC era and early in the first century AD. Pliny says this, uh, Essenes are also mentioned by Josephus, but this quote is from Pliny. On the west side of the Dead Sea, but out of range of the Noxus exhalations of the coast, is the solitary tribe of the Essenes, which is remarkable beyond all other tribes in the whole world, as it has no women and has renounced all sexual desire, has no money, and only palm trees for company. Well, I prefer a wife to a palm tree, so I don't know that it ever uh, done well in the Qumran community. Now, even though Pliny says that about Qumran, as they've excavated the cemetery that Qumran, they have found children and women. And that's probably because Qumran was occupied by different people at different times over two or 300 years. So when you talk about Qumran, you also have to talk about which settlement or which period are you talking about. And so we really don't know all the details about who lived there, when. Uh, some believe that it was also a, a Roman garrison for a time. Uh, that is, uh, in, the, in the early Christian era. The other thing about um, the people of Qumran is that they had a high esteem for Scripture. And as I mentioned, one of the first scrolls was a commentary on the book of Habakkuk. Scripture was so important to them. And they would interpret Scripture. And they would apply it to their situation currently. Which is very much how we read and interpret Scripture today. Uh, a pastor gives a sermon. He'll say, okay, this is what is said to the original audience. This is what it has to say to us. And he gives us an application. Apply it to our lives today. The Qumran community was very similar. Now, their worship, and you might think, well, weren't they like 2,000 years ago? Their worship is very similar to worship that we have today. And that might surprise you. They would have prayer. They would sing praises. They would read scripture. They even had something once a year, a communal meal. 
um, many church traditions, you know, on a periodic, weekly, monthly basis, we celebrate the Lord's Supper. We have a communal meal that, that we use to remember. They had something, of course, they're not Christians. This was before the time of Christ, but they had something that was like a, a precursor, uh, a, a type of communal meal as well. The other thing that might surprise you is those, these are Jewish people, and even though animal sacrifices are still occurring in, Jer- in the temple in Jerusalem, they did not have animal sacrifices at Qumran for several reasons. One is the people that lived in Qumran were separating themselves from the Jerusalem religious structure which had become corrupt. And they wanted to get out of town and live a holy, righteous life that was not contaminated and corrupted um, by what they had seen in Jerusalem. And so they had a focus on being clean, on being pure. If you do animal sacrifices, there's two problems with that. When you slaughter an animal, guess what? You get blood all over yourself, and you get animal guts all over yourself, And if you live in a dry, arid region, you don't have a lot of water. Secondly, animals cost money. So it's a very expensive endeavor. And if you're living out in the middle of nowhere, sort of a monastic kind of life, you just don't have a lot of money. So for whatever reason, and some people think that the Qumran people had a Pharisaic background, which was separate from the temple, so they were not the Sadducees and the priests who were doing the sacrifices. So this is one of the reasons that they think that um, it was not the priestly people who were not part of Qumran. So for whatever reason, they didn't practice animal sacrifices. They also understood, based on scripture, that there would be two messiahs that were coming. And that might surprise you. Two messiahs? Well, I thought Jesus was the messiah. What are two messiahs? What are we talking about here? Well, if we take a look in the Old Testament, we see that after the Babylonian exile, there was not a king that sat upon the throne of David any longer. Right after the Babylonian exile, we, in the books of Haggai and Zechariah, we have two figures. We have this priestly figure, Joshua, And we have a descendant of David, a governor, a political ruler called Zerubbabel. And he was a descendant of David. Now, I thought that was a really cool name, but my wife said, no, we're not naming our kids Zerubbabel. I said, well, we could just call him Z. And she said, no, 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 we're not doing that. Then also, we read two other post-exile books, Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra was a priest. Nehemiah was the political governor of the people. Now, one of the great things is, is for us as Christians, we see that when Jesus Christ came, he fulfilled both those roles together and embodied both those roles as one person. And so we speak of Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah. We speak of him as king. Was he last uh, several weeks leading up to Easter? You know, on Good Friday, he was crucified as the king of the Jews. You know, so he, he said, yes, I am a king, as you say. But then we read the book of Hebrews, and what does the author of Hebrews tell us? He's our great high priest. So Jesus took both those mindsets of Messiah and fulfilled both of those for those that would recognize him as the Messiah. In many ways, the people at Quran lived a very communal lifestyle. You had a year, I guess you could call it probation. You could come, you would give them your money and your property. You tried it for a year. If you said, yep, I'm sticking with it, then that money was used by the community. If after a year you say, yeah, I'm out of here, you got your money back and you can go on your way. So I guess a, a try it commune, I guess you could see, say. Now, you notice the last thing up there. I have to mention something about spitting. And you're probably wondering, what does this have to do with the Dead Sea Scrolls? Now, several things. But also, I actually preached a sermon on spit one time. And you might think, why would I do that? Because Jesus spit on somebody. 
It's in the Bible. You don't have to make these things up. It's amazing what you find in the Bible. Well, one of the things that, uh, that bothered the people of Qumran, and that is they being clean, being pure. So you couldn't even spit. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of their scrolls says this, that uh, they, are not, they are careful not to spit into the midst of the company or to the right. And then it also says, whoever spat in the assembly of the congregation should do penance for 30 days. Yeah, I, I would be doing a lot of penance. Now, if you think that, well, that, you can't even spit. Well, let me tell you something else that you couldn't do on the Sabbath. You couldn't go on the Sabbath. You had to hold it on the Sabbath. And the reason you had to hold it on the Sabbath is because of all days, you're supposed to be righteous and pure and clean. And, well, you can't do those things and be pure and clean. So, again, I don't think I would have worked out really well living at Qumran. I don't think that had been the place that I'd fit in real good. All right, that gives you a little back, bit of background at Qumran. Here's the archaeological site of Qumran. This was when I was there in 92. Uh, some of you have been there since. Excavations occur all the time. It may look similar. It may look different. As I said, it's a very dry area. What do you need in a dry area? You need water. These people were very intelligent, smart engineers. They had huge reservoirs like this to store water. They had conduits that ran up into the Judean hills, so when the rain did come, it would just come right down into these reservoirs. Uh, it's amazing what you can do without electricity. It's just gravity. Imagine people lived without technology. We're actually doing this without technology. It's amazing. I, I, I like to say that it's probably a good thing that the pyramids and the Great Wall of China were built before TV and a Wi-Fi, otherwise we just wouldn't have time to get around to it, you know. There's also a room called a scriptorium. Now, one of the reasons that this room was called this from very early on was there was an inkwell discovered there. In fact, great, this is where they wrote the scrolls. They have found a few other ink wells. However, they have been unable, as far as I know, to match the ink in the ink wells to the ink on the scrolls. So there's nothing that really says they were written and copied there. But they're still working on that. But uh, so far, I've not read anything definitive about uh, finding anything that connects the two. They had uh, meals together in a dining hall. Uh, they had a place where they stored all their pottery. Of course, they had to have women there, you know, they had to have all their dishes, you know, in cabinets and stuff like that, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe they did have more than palm trees. They had a huge stash of pottery. This photo, I think, is very important because this is what's leading us into some evidence on the time and dating of the Dead Sea Scrolls. There was an earthquake recorded by early historians, 31 B.C., this is what the earthquake did to these stairs at Qumran. And so we know that Qumran, that this part of Qumran was built by 31 BC. We don't know how much earlier, but we know at least 31 BC. And as you can see, um, there's probably a lot of guys live there because they didn't get around to fixing it. Yeah. <laughs> so not only can we date Qumran by the earthquake, but also by what kind of pottery and what kind of lamps we find there. This is a lamp from the Persian period, from about 450 to 350 BC. This is a seven uh, spouted or pinched uh, lampstand from the time of Zechariah, the book of Zechariah. Now, I am such a nerd that I wrote my master's thesis, 60 pages on this lampstand. I know more about this lampstand than I care to know and you care to know and... Uh, find out not too many people know much about this and not too many people cared, so. <laughs> but as you can see, if you have seven spouts, you have seven wicks, you're going to use up a lot of oil. Yeah. So it wasn't very green and eco-friendly to have that one. There are other, we can date lamps from other periods. 
the Greek period, the Roman period. And so when we see lamps from these eras, then we can say, okay, they were living here by at least this time or during this time period. So as you can see that it's pretty reasonable to say that people were living at Qumran 100 to 200 years before the time of Christ. That's pretty reasonable based on what we find with the lamps, the pottery, the earthquake, as well as coins. So we find coins there. Well, you can date coins by, well, gee, is that George or Abraham on the front of that coin, you know? Well, they, they would put different Caesars and different people on their coins. I think you remember a little story about Jesus holding up a coin. Okay, well, that's also another way to find out the time period of when people lived there. So we have pottery, lamps, coins, the earthquake to help us figure out when did people at Qumran live there, when possibly were these scrolls written as well. Now let's talk about the scrolls. Now when we think of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we primarily think of biblical books, and there were. But there are also non-canonical books, and what I mean by non-canonical books are uh, those, uh, maybe uh, if you're a Lutheran tradition, do you, you guys have the Apocrypha? You guys don't use Apocrypha, okay? <clears throat> Some Lutheran traditions do. You have books like Maccabees, The Wisdom of uh, Ben Syrah, um, Tobit, some of those books that the Jews felt, well, you know, these were important books, but they weren't on the same level as scripture. So they didn't want to discard them because they were helpful for their, their devotional life, but they realized they weren't just scripture. Uh, in the same way that, uh, you know, if you read a book by Billy Graham, you wouldn't say, oh, that's heretical. No, but you wouldn't say it's scripture either, would you? No, it's just an a, a, uh, enriching book. And so you, we find books like this as well. We also find books that we call pseudepigrapha, that is, false writings. Writings that aren't scripture, they really have no religious basis. Um, they're just weird. Okay. And then we have community texts, like some of the early scrolls that were found, that explain how they live out their life at Qumran, uh, some of their beliefs, how they understand end times, and things of that nature. So there's four different genres of scrolls that we find there. But if you're like me, you're most interested in the biblical books. And if we take a look at which books were found there, we find that every book except the book of Esther or a portion of every biblical book, and when I say biblical book, I'm talking about just the Old Testament because the New Testament hasn't been written yet because Jesus isn't even on the scene yet. So except for the book of Nehemiah at that time, Nehemiah and Esther. Now, however, we considered at that time Ezra and Nehemiah being one book. So we had portions of Ezra, so we assumed that, ne that Nehemiah had been attached to the scroll but had deteriorated, and we didn't have any um, portions of Nehemiah. Since then, we found, I believe it's one letter from the book of Nehemiah. So uh, we can say now we found Nehemiah, the Dead Sea. Uh, scroll find. However, we still have not found any copies of Esther. Now, why do we not have any copies of Esther? Well, maybe for several reasons. Esther may have been written very late in the Old Testament period. Secondly, you may or may not know that God's name is not mentioned in the book of Esther. You can see God working through the book of Esther, but he is not mentioned. And so it's like, should we have a book of the Bible without God mentioned? You can see how that could be been a dilemma. So it may not have received, and when I say popular, I mean in the sense that people had not received it as the word of God yet. And so maybe they had not realized, okay, maybe we should copy this down. Maybe this is a helpful book. And that may be one reason, or it could be that Maybe there was one or two copies and they just deteriorated and turned to dust. We just don't know. One of those unanswered questions. 
Another way we can date the scrolls is that they were written on cow and goat hide. And that means cows and goats were alive. That means you can do DNA testing, you can do carbon-14 testing. And I know that when you hear a lot from uh, creation apologetics, they talk about how unreliable carbon-14 testing is, and that's true. However, they have done some carbon-14 testing on the Dead Sea Scrolls, which placed them about 350 to 50 BC, exactly during this time period. So they have some testing that just puts it right there at that date that help confirms it with all the other evidence as well. Also, what they can do is they can take a little portion of a scroll, do DNA testing and find out, oh, Bessie, that cow, her skin was part of this one and this one and this one and this one. And you can sort of put all the little pieces of the book together if you know they all came from the same cow. So that's sort of a way to, to put the scrolls together like a jigsaw puzzle. So one of the things that uh, my oldest son and I did when the Dead Sea Scroll exhibit was in Seattle at the Pacific Science Center, we volunteered, and that was one of our favorite things to do was talk about the DNA testing, how it was used in, to, to fit the pieces of the Dead Sea Scrolls together. So if you're keeping track at home, or here because we're not on, on streaming, we have pottery, we have earthquake, we have lamps, we have carbon-14 dating, uh, we have DNA testing, and something else we use to date the scrolls is handwriting. If you notice, people don't have the same handwriting. And if you notice that some people like me, the older you get, pretty much your signature is just a flat line. And maybe that's because I know I'm getting the age in life that one day I will be a flat line. I don't, I don't know how that works. Or, or because if you're a doctor, you know, it's just like just a line. I, I don't know how the pharmacist figures out who, who signed the thing. Well, the same is with scribes. Scribes had different handwritings. And so people who are way smarter than me can say, oh, well, that was that scribe who wrote that scroll. Oh, it was that scribe that wrote that scroll. Oh, it was that scribe that wrote that one. So this one goes over here, this one goes over here, this one goes over here. And so they can match the pieces of the Dead Sea Scrolls together based on handwriting, which I think is very impressive. Also, if you see up on top there, that we have an ancient form of Hebrew, and we have what's called the block script type of Hebrew. Language changes over time. Handwriting changes over time. And so, as well as script changes over time. Now, one of the things I like to do when I go to a Dead Sea Scroll exhibit, uh, I took uh, our church when we were back in Indiana to the Field Museum in Chicago. I took a, a group of people to uh, the Seattle when I was there. And we were on vacation in L.A., uh, my friend, uh, a friend of my son's was with us. We were going down to Tijuana to build a house. On the way back, we stopped at the Dead Sea Scroll exhibit in L.A. Not very many people know how to read Hebrew. Anybody besides me know how to read Hebrew? Okay. Yeah, very few. And uh, I'm one of those weird people who thought learning Hebrew was easier than Greek. But you read from right to left, and it's hard to remember the vocabulary because it's just with Greek sometimes you can squint and you can sort of figure out what the word is and you know you, you come across a word like phileo oh well yeah I can figure out that Philadelphia okay I, I know what that word means well I point people to this ancient handwriting this ancient handwriting on top it's the paleo form of God's name Yahweh and so when you read the scrolls, it will be in this block print until it gets to God's name, and then it'll be this ancient hand script, ancient handwriting. And so even if you don't know Hebrew, you can go through there, and you can say, ah, there's God's name. Ah, there's God's name, Yahweh. And so my son, who was in high school, and his friend, they, they would just look to see if they could find God's name in the biblical scrolls. And so it's a way to, to make it not seem, well, well, it's just an ancient artifact, you know, it's just some old thing. Hey, this is important because God's name is mentioned in these scrolls. But does our language change? Absolutely. How many of you guys know English? Okay. Uh, go ahead and uh, read uh, Middle English here. It doesn't look like English, does it? 
but I thought we all knew English. Well, here's uh, English from the King James period. This is sort of like if you squint well enough and hard enough, you can sort of make out a few words. But you would have a very difficult time reading 1611 English. Now, it's not just way back then. How about 200 years ago? You ever read this important document called like the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution? And you come across this really weird letter and you say, what is that? It's sort of like an F without the crossbar on it. It's like, what's up with that? They don't teach us that letter in school. That's not in our alphabet. And then you find out that's how they do an S when it's not the last S. It's like, what? You mean English that we know changes? So not only does our language change, but Hebrew changed as well. But we just don't think about our language changing. So the reason I talk about this is to explain what we find in the Dead Sea Scrolls. How is that different from our Bible? And how is it the same? So many of the differences in the scrolls of the Dead Sea are primarily differences in spelling and pronunciation. And we dismiss those as, as n really not even a difference. For instance, in English, we don't use U's like the British. The British like to stick another U in there, Savior, with a U. We don't put the U in for Savior. But it's the same word. We just spell it differently. Other differences that we find between the, our Bible and the Dead Sea Scrolls is, is it first person or third person? MT stands for the Masoretic Text. Before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls 2,000 years ago, the oldest copy of the Hebrew Bible was 1,000 years old, 1,000 years after the time of Christ. 2,000 years or more from when they were written in the Old Testament period. So we had 1,000 years of things that had been copied and copied and copied and copied. So 1000 AD had been the oldest copy of the Old Testament. So MT is what our Bibles were based on before the Dead Sea Scrolls. So MT stands for that copy. And that is very intact. It's uh, almost complete, the Masoretic text. But it's not as old. So the Masoretic text said, and he said, what shall I cry? Out of Isaiah 46, the Dead Sea Scrolls says, and I said, what shall I cry? Now, if you read that passage in context, you'll find out that the passage, the whole chapter is in first person, and I said seems to be more reasonable. And so some translations have it first person, some translations have the third person. Uh, I looked it up that uh, in Isaiah 46, the NIV, the New Living Translation, follow the Dead Sea Scrolls here. And they will use, and I said, rather than the Masoretic text, and he said. And usually there's a little foot, footnote in your Bible that'll say that. Some ancient manuscripts will say, da 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 da. Isaiah 6, 5, uh, 6 3 says, the Masoretic text, holy, holy, holy. The Dead Sea Scrolls just says, holy, holy. What happened to the other holy? I don't know, did somebody like me sort of drift off and <laughs> not get the last holy in there? Um, you would be amazed that that scribes made very few mistakes because they would count how many letters, they would write those in the margins, they, they would just double check things. I don't know. But as you notice, is there a difference in the meaning? Is there, is there a difference in the sense of the passage? No, not at all. It's just a slight difference. Take a look at Genesis 1.9. Here we have a difference, not in spelling, but in a different word being used. And if you look at the Hebrew, you'll see that they look very similar. In the Masoretic text, in Genesis 1.9, it says, let the waters be gathered into one place, makom. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls say, let the waters be gathered into one gathering, and instead of an M on the end, you have like a H sound, okay? And 
Now remember, I'm, I'm reading from right to left. You're reading from left to right, okay? So my first letter is your last letter, okay? So look at the first letter going that way, which is really the last letter. I know you're really confused, aren't you? So I'll show you that. That sort of looks like that if you don't write it real neatly. Again, is there a difference in the sense of the passage? Not at all. Let the waters be gathered into one place. Let them be gathered into one gathering. It's the same sense, even though a different word was used. Let's take a look at another example. Isaiah 40, 12. The Masoretic text has measured the waters. The Dead Sea Scrolls adds another yod, another letter, <coughs> excuse me, in between. Measured the waters of the sea. So you can see here on this one, you have two yodes instead of one. Again, is the meaning the same? Measure the waters, measure the waters of the sea? Absolutely. There's no difference in the meaning or the sense of the passage at all, even though it's just a different word choice. Isaiah 45, 7. Here, we have a different word with a different meaning. The Masoretic text says, I will make peace, shalom. The Dead Sea Scroll says, I will make good, tov. And here, Bible translators have to decide which one do we use. So I took a look at the NIV. The, I, the NIV, their translators, they tried to make both work. And so they chose the word prosperity. And I think they chose prosperity because that's sort of peace and good. So they weren't sure which one to use, so they sort of tried to find a word that had both meanings. <coughs> Is that cheating? No, that's not cheating. The New Living Translation translation says, I will make good times. Again, they're trying to get both senses. But you can't put both in, can you, when you do a translation of the Bible? <coughs> Excuse me. You have to decide which one are you going to use. And so some Bible translations try to capture the sense of both words when they're not sure which one to use. But again, does it really affect the meaning of the passage? Not necessarily. That if God says, I'm going to bring about peace, I'm going to make things good, well, I think that's about the same kind of thing. Here is a situation where the Dead Sea Scrolls add something that the Masoretic text doesn't. The Masoretic text just says, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. The Dead Sea Scrolls adds, and forgave them their sin because of him. Okay. The NIV and New Living Translation here follow the Masoretic text. They do not add the extra that the Dead Sea Scrolls does here. But again, is there anything heretical about and forgave them their sin because of him? No, because it tells us in Job that, that God listened to the prayers of Job and, and his kids were forgiven because of his prayers. So it's, it's nothing that contradicts scripture. It was just seen as an addition. Now you might say, why would somebody add this? At this time, there is no Bible. There is no, this is the word of God from page one to, to the end. We have these copies and we have God's word, but it's not in this final canonized form yet. So there was no, there was nothing that said to a scribe that, well, you can't add something. There was, there was no um, prohibiting of doing something like that. It was a very fluid document at this time before it was finalized and canonized. In Job 42, 11, we find the word sheep in the Masoretic text. It says a piece of money. If you happen to look up that uh, footnote, you can find a footnote on that if you look in the NIV. And it says, it was a unit of money of unknown weight and value. Some footnotes say, we're not really sure what the word means. We're not really sure how to do to uh, translate it. But then again, let's think about the culture. 
livestock was their bank account. If you had a cow, a sheep, well, that's sort of like having a coin or a dollar or a, a $20 bill or something. So again, is there a difference in meaning? No. Both of them talk about something of value of which you would use to purchase something, whether livestock or a coin. So these are all those th things that you can find in those footnotes, and you're thinking, I don't even have time to read my Bible. I own the footnotes at the bottom. <clears throat> so here is a very, I guess, one of the more I guess, I don't know if popular is the right word uh, <clears throat> discoveries found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Psalm 145 is an acrostic. And if you remember what acrostics are, you, you may need to know that because coming up here in a couple of weeks is Mother's Day. M is for the many things, you know. You remember those acrostics from grade school. Well, the problem with bringing an acrostic in Hebrew over to English is we have a different number of letters than Hebrew. So it doesn't work bringing it across letter for letter. In the Masoretic text, when you're reading down in A, B, C, there is no noon, that, which is an N letter. It's missing. It's the only letter missing in the acrostic. All the other letters of the Hebrew alphabet are there in Psalm 145 except for the N. And it's like, what happened to it? Well, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's there. And it says, God is faithful in his words and gracious to, in all his deeds. So now many of the modern translations include this. The NIV uh, includes it. However, the NIV does not include the repetitive phrase that the Dead Sea Scrolls has, which is blessed be the Lord and blessed be his name forever. They do that after each letter. So here's my question. Did the original Psalm have the N letter in the acrostic? I don't know. Did something happen to it? Did somebody spill coffee on it and they didn't copy it because they didn't know what it was? I don't know. Did some scribe at Qumran put it in because it's like, well, I got to have all the letters of the alphabet. I don't know. But then again, let's take a look at it. Is this something that We've heard in scripture before, God is faithful in his words and gracious in all his deeds. Is there anything unbiblical about that? No. Do we find that elsewhere in scripture? Absolutely. Even if a scribe made it up, it, it's a complimentary to scripture. It doesn't contradict scripture at all. So these are the things that Bible translation, translators have to figure out. Do we put it in or don't? So most of your modern translations will have it. And again, there'll be a footnote at the bottom. Then there are several t passages, like in Jeremiah 10, where the Masoretic text has a longer uh, section of Jeremiah chapter 10. The Septuagint, which is a Greek translation written in about 300 B.C., and for some of those of you who are history buffs, you remember there's a certain guy from Macedonia named Alexander the Great who thought he'd just conquer the world and wouldn't it be great if everybody just spoke Greek? Well, even Jews started speaking Greek. They didn't know how to read Hebrew anymore. They didn't understand Hebrew anymore. They didn't understand their Bible anymore. So the Jewish leaders say, well, we've got to translate this into the language of the people now. We've got to translate our Hebrew Old Testament into Greek so we don't forget what God said. So that's the, the Greek uh, version. It's called the Septuagint, LXX, or 70, because um, there was a, a um, probably not true tradition that 70 scribes copied it in 70 days. So that's why we have the LXX being for the, the Greek translation. Now, interesting that in the Dead Sea Scrolls finds, we have a copy of Jeremiah 10 that has a longer version and another copy that has a short version. And so they said, we're fine with both versions. Now, we're, we have an Alexander the Great or Greek mindset. Here in the United States, it's got to be this way or it's got to be that way. 
It's got to be right or wrong. Can't be both. However, Hebrews were fine with both. That didn't bother them. They were fine with two different versions. That didn't bother them. It's still the word of God. I mean, if you think about it, I wonder how many different translations of the Bible we have here. Or I bet they're all different, right? Well, how can that be? How can we have a different version? How can we all, don't all have the same one? We're okay with having different versions, right? And I think God did that for a purpose. If you think about it, he didn't send his word down on golden plates, did he? And he didn't tell some guy in a cave in Arabia everything that he wanted to say, just one person. And we had to trust that guy that he'd write it down accurately, right? So we're okay from a Hebrew standpoint of having both in. If you think about it, we have a creation account in Genesis chapter one, and we have a creation account in Genesis chapter two. They aren't contradictory, they are complementary. And think about this, why do we have four gospels? Why not just one? We have four complementary accounts of Jesus' ministry and teaching and life and death and resurrection. Think about that. We have different versions of the gospel. And we're okay with that. It wasn't like, oh, that's got to be Matthew, that Mark guy, he's just off base. You know, we don't do that. So the people at Qumran were okay with having two different versions. And we see another situation where we have four different scrolls, the Masoretic text, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Greek Septuagint, and Josephus, his historical writings. They all have something totally different. None of them match. So you have to decide here in 1 Samuel 10 and 1 Samuel 11, who's right? You got four different ones. And so this is what Bible scholars do with all their time, all their free time. Now, here's what I want to tell you. Did you notice anything really terrible about all these differences? Heretical? Are they just minor little things? They don't affect the meaning. They don't affect the theology. They don't affect the sense of the passage at all. And actually what we found is because so much of what we find in the Dead Sea Scrolls matches what we have in Scripture, it tells us that we have a reliable transmission of Scripture for over 3,000 years. Amen. And I, I think that's very important. And no longer do we have to say, if somebody says, well, how do you know that somebody didn't make stuff up in the Bible? I, I hear that your copy of the Bible is only 1,000 years old. It's like, no, it's over 2,000 years old now. And you can say, 2,000 years ago, it says this. 1,000 years ago, it says this. It still says this today. And why is this important? Because especially as we talk about apologetics, we, and most of the time you have creation apologetics, and we're trying to match that to Scripture. Well, we need to know that our Scripture is reliable. It can be trusted and it has proven itself faithful for over 3,000 years in written transmission. That's not even including the oral transmission of Scripture until it was written down. So you do not need to doubt Scripture. You do not need to doubt that, oh, yes, yeah, so, some guy in Qumran just made things up and put them in the Bible. It, it did not work that way. God was faithful in inspiring people to write it. He was faithful in inspiring people to copy it. And the great thing is, is God's word still changes lives today. It's still a living word today. And I just think it's amazing, the whole process, that God used ordinary people like you and me to continue the transmission of his word. And like he would trust us to get the word from Abraham to us. I find that pretty amazing. Amen. And it shows you how some guy who says, yeah, I, I saw some golden plates and God told me everything in a cave. Yeah, probably not a lot of credibility to that because they don't have any evidence. Nobody has the golden plates. Nobody has 
you know, e e these ancient manuscripts that Muhammad received. But we have evidence. Evidence that helps support that we have a faith that has substance. It's not a blind faith. But that's what archaeology doesn't prove anything. It helps support and give credence 